so welcome everyone to the first uh, political economy session of the CSA conference this year. We are <clears throat> delighted to have uh, five incredible speakers to talk to us today. And this is the first in a series of four political economy sessions, one tomorrow afternoon and then two on, on Wednesday afternoon as well. <clears throat> so just before we get started, let me let me set some, some ground rules. We're gonna start about now. Then each of the five speakers is going to have 15 minutes to present. And there will be no question at the end of each talk. The questions are gonna be at the end of all the talks. And then we're going to have questions for for everyone. You can, <clears throat> sorry, you can submit your question kind of during the talks in the Q and A function, or you can kind of wait until the end to to ask your question directly. That's you can do this whichever way you you want. And then if your question is selected, we can ask you kind of we'll ask you to unmute yourself and ask the question directly. Or if you'd rather, we can ask the question uh, directly as well. So um, we uh, and just to note, the session is recorded. So if you use if you are unmuted and you ask your question, whatever you say is going to be recorded. So uh, just a bit of a heads up on that. And so, you know, without further ado, why don't we uh, ask Marcus to talk to us about institutions and uh, growth? Thank you, Julia. Um, so I'll just okay. stop the other screen yeah. and share. Whilst I do that, I want to just have a quick shout out to Rose, it's very nice to almost see you, Rose. Um, and I hope I see you next year if I get a chance of presenting next year. So this is um, work with my co-author, Vanessa Bose, um, And the title is Which Institutions Rule? And we're trying to unbundle the democracy growth nexus. So um, for actually a surprisingly long time, um, people were quite skeptical about any kind of link between democracy and economic prosperity broadly speaking, that there's a positive link. Um, there were certain arguments against, uh, theoretical arguments against uh, such a positive link. But then more recently, if you allow 2008 to be recent, um, there has been a body of research which established that um, the dividend from democratization is, is, is positive and large. So what we want to ask in this paper really is how do these studies define democracy? Um, which building blocks do you need um, and, and do they all matter equally? And um, one of the sort of core papers here is this Asimogluidal paper in the JPE two, a few years ago, ANRR, and they refer to these different institutions of democracy as bundles. And so this is why we are asking, um, why we're calling it unbundling and why we ask which institutions matter most. Um, there's a link here to an earlier literature in the early 2000s where there was this um, debate raging over the deep determinants of growth institutions versus geography versus trade. Um, and, and a number of those people um, were then, you know, most strikingly, of course, um, Darren Asimoglu and co some of the co-authors um, were involved in this um, recent democracy literature. And one point we're making in, in the introductory sections of this paper is that um, there's actually quite a big overlap between the measures, so the empirical measures used to study institutional change and to study democratization or democ democratic regime change, they, they are surprisingly similar. There's, there's some overlap. Um, so we really want to find out um, what is driving this positive uh, democracy growth nexus, which institutions are driving this. And the way we're going to be doing this is we're, uh, we're drilling down. So we're using an overarching um, concept of liberal democracy, which is made up of of what people call polyarchy, so everything related to um, representation and uh, electoral democracy, and then a liberal component which captures uh, rule of law and other things. And these these uh, underlying institutions are here in the in the third tier. So you can see electoral democracy is defined by clean elections, freedom of expression, freedom of association, suffrage, and uh, elected chief executive. Um, although I should mention immediately, these two will not be subject to analysis in this paper because we're looking at post-World War II data and the vast majority of countries in the world had universal suffrage and the vast majority of countries in the world had um, elected chief executives in that time period. Um, and then the liberal component has these executive constraints as they're sometimes called legislative and judicial and also rule of law component, which for economists of interest has um, um, private property rights, for instance. <clears throat> 
Um, and here, this is far too small for you to see, but there's some references here to empirical and theoretical papers going back to this um, literature in the early 2000s. So there are people like Easterly, um, Hall and Jones, some of you might know as a 1999 as a seminal paper, but also more recent work um, by Danny Roderick with Mukand in the EJ uh, last year or two years ago. Um, and so these have picked out different elements that um, um, or empirical uh, versions of these different institutions. And we're trying to study them. In effect, we're running horse races between them to see which ones what quote unquote matter most. And we're gonna be a bit more um, general about that in a moment. So I was going to show you um, something about um, our methodology and how to think about it. But I think with 15 minutes, it's, it's probably quite tricky, but um, we're going to use a methodology that's situated in a treatment effects literature. Um, and we're going to use binary uh, treatment variables, so dummies for democratization or democratic regime change or institutional change. Um, and so um, it, it's our, our foundation for these data is, is, is VDEM, and these are continuous indices varying from zero to one. And um, so we're using the mean um, across the entire sample as the cutoffs, but there's robustness checks as well using alternative cutoffs. Um, we're using a heterogeneous treatment effect model. So you see that these betas here have subscript I for country I. Um, and we have a little conceptual development section in the paper where we explain why this makes a lot of sense to think about the relationship between democracy and um, economic development differing across countries in the long run. Um, we also have a, a number of additional controls in this model. Um, again, uh, this conceptual development will indicate how these controls speak to the existing economic theory here. And then we have this strange thing here. Um, this is called a multi-factor error structure. Um, like I said, I was hoping to speak more to this, but what, what you can think of, you are probably familiar with the synthetic control approach, which is very popular and quite iconic, quite nice to talk about also to students. And, um, and, and this sort of simplified takes a weighted average of a number of um, countries that makes up, so together these make up a, a synthetic control country. And there's a, uh, an extension of this by one of the PhD students of Heinmüller, who with Abadie was one of the creators of synthetic control. And, um, and here, rather than um, using averages, weighted averages of countries, this uses the building blocks of macro variables. These are um, unobserved common factors. Um, so the way to think about this is that all macro variables are driven by a relatively small number of common factors that have that are orthogonal to each other and have country specific coefficients. And so you can create very um, idiosyncratic developments um, with this setup. Um, and we're going to use that to, um, so we, this, this estimator was not developed by us. It's um, a recent Journal of Economics and Business Statistics paper. Um, and so this empirical setup basically allows us to claim that um, we can have um, heterogeneous treatment effects in the face of um, selection into treatment. So uh, becoming a democracy is not an exogenous process. And, and similarly, it's also uh, allowing for non-parallel trends pre-treatment, most importantly, between treated countries and control countries. So just mechanically briefly, the, um, this is the estimation equation and these F hats are common factors or so principal components estimated from the same equation in the control countries. The control countries are those that never uh, experienced democracy. The treated group are the countries that at one point moved from autocracy to democracy or maybe the other way. Uh, and the only countries excluded from our analysis are those that have been democracies um, throughout. Um, I'm also using an approach here where we emphasize the long run. And so we feel it really matters um, how much time you spend in democracy. And I'm going to explain that in more detail now. Um, so normally when you had these heterogeneous treatment effects, the most logical thing to report would be an average treatment effect on the treated. So that's simply the average across these heterogeneous beta I hats. But as I mentioned, you know, some countries have been in democracy for one year, others for many, many decades. Um, so we would just average across these very heterogeneous experiences. Secondly, 
um, we're also qualitatively interested. Is democracy an effect that gives you a, a one-off boost to your economic development? Or is it a perpetual growth effect? So if you're thinking of sort of the difference between a, a solar type model and an endogenous growth model, would it not be possible that democracy fosters um, innovation and therefore could be a, a, a perpetual growth engine for your economic development? So um, there are other aspects that um, we need to take into account. So um, countries don't typically just move from autocracy to democracy. Some do, but others reverse and they have sort of several attempts. They're going back and forth. Um, so we call this regime reversal dynamics, the number of times you cross into democracy or out of it. Um, there are also differential sample characteristics. So we're all familiar with unbalanced panel data. So again, we don't want to treat a country that has um, only data from 1990 in the same way that we want to treat a country that has earlier um, data. And finally, and that's very important for our specific approach for what we're particularly interested in, I, I, I identified these sort of six characteristics, these six institutions that we want to study. And if we just studied them separately, we would, we would in essence be saying that um, these are exogenous and they are sort of not related to each other so that um, clean elections, for instance, would not be related to freedom of association or freedom of expression. Um, and that's quite silly. And so in our, um, in our presentation of the results, we condition on the evolution of, of the other institutions um, in, in the same, cat, in the same uh, sort of level, in the same tier. So we do this by using um, these running line plots. So you can think of this as a smoother for the beta I hat against the years in democracy, also accounting for the number of times the threshold was um, breached, the, the start year, the dummy for a start year, and then the level and standard deviation of arrival indicator during the time the country was above the threshold. So if we looked at clean elections, we would also put in the level um, of freedom of expression index and the level of the freedom of association index, as well as the standard deviations for both of these over the years that the country was above the clean election threshold. So it's a little bit convoluted, but hopefully you see what I mean. We're, we're trying to condition on the rival institutions. We have an alternative empirical methods where we're, um, where we're sort of more head on focusing on this conditionality, the idea that, you know, clean elections can may have a conditional effect on de economic development, provided you have freedom of expression or other other institutions. Um, just briefly on the inference. So if we estimated this um, average treatment effect, um, we would use a non-parametric variance, variance estimator, which is very, very simple. Um, and so we just apply the same to the local linear regression. We've also got some results with bootstrapping, um, but I'm not going to be having time to present these. So how am I presenting the results? So here on the x-axis, we're going to look at the top tier here, just the overarching notion of liberal democracy. On the x-axis, you have the years spent in above the threshold. On the y-axis, the what we claim causal effect of becoming a liberal democracy on economic development, so income per capita um, in percent. And so here, this would be the effect. I've then uh, got the, so these are the country predictions. This is just these circles, these markers are just for you to see where countries are situated. So these are perturbed a little bit. Um, so you can see these hollow ones in the first 15 years, we suggest there's no statistically significant impact of democracy on economic development, but then it takes off and you see this relationship would appear almost linear. Uh, and this is based on a sample of 66 countries with 59 in the control sample. The median uh, length is 28 years. So that would give you just under 20% um, if growth, if, sorry, levels effect of, um, of democracy on economic development. Um, let me now focus on this lower tier, these six um, institutions, and I'm going to first focus on these three and then separately on these three. So again, the same graph, we're starting with freedom of expression. You can see for a very long time, statistically insignificant effects, but then after about 30 odd years, um, this is positive and significant and rising over time. Um, freedom of association appears to be quite significant early on, but then the effect peters out over time. So 
If we want to have a, a discussion about the very long run effects, then we would say freedom of association doesn't seem to be drying the economic growth in the very long run, but it clearly matters. You know, 35 years is not a trivial time period. Um, similarly, clean elections, um, this is really the one indicator for these electoral democracy uh, set of institutions that starts very early on being significant and positive, and then again, almost in a perhaps linear fashion, increases over time. So the way to read this would be that after about 40 years um, above the threshold for uh, clean elections, you would see around about 15 to 20% higher um, economic uh, development. This is the building blocks of the liberal component. Um, so here we see that rule of law matters early on and then its effect peters out over time. Similarly for the judicial constraints, I'm not sure how to interpret the fact that, you know, this becomes negative significant. Um, I have to do some thinking about that. Um, but the legislative constraints are positive and, and quite large. The scales of these two graphs compared to the previous one, they're, that they're not the same. Um, so you can see again, after 30 years, 20%, after 60 years, about 30% higher economic development. Um, so these, these were kind of the empirics that we did. It's, um, it was very, very fast. And I'm sure you will have lots of misunderstandings. If, if you have any questions, it'd be great to put them in the Q&A, uh, since unfortunately I won't be able to, to stay um, for the last part of the uh, session. We, we then wanted to point out some quite sobering thoughts related to our results and recent developments in sort of democracy across the world. So um, these are, uh, the, the, on the x-axis here, the share of countries in what was our treated sample that saw an erosion of democratic institutions over the last or over the over the 10 years um, prior to the end of our sample period. And you can see this varies between around 40% and up to 62%. So a very large share of countries saw some decline uh, in these institutions. Liberal democracy is the overarching uh, democracy index. These are the components. And what is perhaps quite striking is that those components that we find are most important in the very long run for economic development, namely the fair elections, um, uh, freedom of expression, and also legislative constraints, those are the ones that saw the largest average drop. So you can see uh, legislative constraints in those samples that in those countries that we analyzed as treated, um, they dropped by around 13%. Um, Overall liberal democracy, the index dropped by similarly 13% over this time period. So we're just remarking on this and we think it's quite worrying. Um, it may be that you know, the positive, strong positive effects of uh, some of these uh, institutions that we found in our analysis um, are significantly undermined by these developments in the last decade or so. So let me wrap up. So we want to talk a bit more about what are the building blocks of the sort of quite elusive term democracy that drives the positive democracy growth relationship that has been found in the recent literature. Um, and so we take a hierarchical concept of liberal democracy and we then drill down to see which institutions seem to matter most. And we use a causal treatment effects mod uh, model and um, we have this notion of time and treatment as, as being informative on, on how, um, how our, um, effect pans out over time. And so we find that electoral democracy uh, and particularly clean elections and freedom of expression seem to matter in the long run. Um, but we also find an element of the liberal component, uh, the legislative constraints uh, to be a driving force. Now, it's, it's very, very important. This was a very short presentation. It's important to emphasize what we're not saying. Um, so we're not saying only those institutions that are mentioned here seem to matter and everything else doesn't matter. Um, so I, I, in the paper, we talk a lot about the effect at the medium treatment length. So this would be kind of the, what countries on average could experience. Um, the other thing that's really important to mention is we don't talk about sequencing. So when people talk about uh, becoming a democracy, you know, what are the, what sequence of different institutional change uh, 
uh, what should the sequence be of institutional change in order not just to become a successful democracy or successfully transition into democracy, but also in order to reap the benefits, the democratic dividend of uh, democratization. So thanks very much. And if you have any questions or comments, um, then please put them in, in the Q&A. Um, and the paper is um, on the CSAE conference website. And, um, and there's also um, a paper on my personal website. And I'm very happy for you to send me questions. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, Marcus. We're going to switch to uh, Jacob, who is going to talk to us about electoral cycles and UN peacekeeping mission. Jacob, you're still muted, I think. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, so thank you very much for having me. And thank you to the organizers uh, for this uh, great uh, conference. So uh, in this paper, I document uh, the existence of electoral cycles in troop contributions to UN peacekeeping operations, and then show how they're hampering um, conflict mitigation. So um, UN peacekeeping obviously constitutes one of the main vehicles for the international community to curb conflicts, but they face a severe policy challenge rely, uh, because they rely completely on voluntary and timely troop contributions uh, from its member states to each uh, mission. And this alongside the fact that conflict mitigation has elements of a global public good, political, Political economy theory uh, in this field generally predicts uh, free riding incentives in the international community and in effect an undersupply of, of peacekeepers. And uh, um, this is really supported by empirical evidence and reflected in practical experience of UN staff and, and leaders uh, that we've really seen a, a, a perpetual undersupply uh, at least since the Cold War uh, 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 that, that is widely believed to hamper conflict mitigation. So this is not, uh, this, this is uh, well studied, obviously, uh, primarily in the political uh, science, science literature, but uh, we're still, I, I believe, um, lacking really conclusive evidence on two uh, key factors that are really underpinning operation success. So the, the first one here being, what are the determinants of countries' true contributions? And second, once deployed, are troops really effective at mitigating conflict? And what I do in this paper is that I exploit exogenous variation in electoral concerns in troop sending countries, countries stemming from the timing of elections to shed light on uh, both of these two rather broad questions. So uh, the theoretical underpinning of the empirical analysis in this study is based on this simple observation, uh, namely that in deciding whether or not to contribute to a distant operation, which is not posing a direct security threat to the contributor, incumbent politicians in democratic countries often face an intertemporal trade-off in the, in the sense that contributions come with, I argue, primarily short-term sailing costs or risks. Uh, you can think of the fact that you're risking countrymen, mission failure, mission misconduct, you turn up troops and resources, and this is salient to the electorate. And this is paired with primarily long-term and rather uncertain benefits of, of uh, contributing. Uh, you can think of future trade, regional stability, long-term foreign policy goals, such as securing a seat at the UN um, Security Council, for example. We add to this uh, common assumptions in the political economy literature of uh, myopic voters and uh, to some degree office-seeking politicians. Uh, we know that such uh, trade-offs are, are known to generate uh, electoral cycles or political business cycles where policies are timed to increase re-election probabilities. And I take this um, very uh, you know, well-studied idea uh, to the context of UN peacekeeping and essentially ask, first of all, specifically, do elections affect countries' troop deployments? And the answer seems to be yes. And second of all, and perhaps more crucially, uh, if this is the case, does this affect mission performance and conflict outcomes? And also here, the answer uh, seems to be yes. So uh, a quick background on UN uh, peacekeeping. So UN peacekeeping uh, mainly uh, focus on maintaining a ceasefire agreement between combatants. And uh, primarily since the uh, 1990s, focus has shifted on mitigating violence and ongoing conflicts. And one speaks more of peace enforcement in many of these missions. 
So since 91, there's been 30 substantial missions uh, fielded. And since 2008, we have around 100,000 UN personnel uh, deployed concurrently, uh, uh, with the bulk of those uh, being uh, military forces. So obviously, um, UN doesn't have its own army, so it relies on uh, contributions from its member states. And uh, um, around 120 countries or so con contribute some personnel during uh, uh, the post-Cold War um, era. Uh, but most of those are small contributions, so-called token contributions. And, uh, around 90 countries or so make a, a substantial contribution to any of these missions um, during the period of the uh, Quickly on operations setup, I can just mention that when compared to a volunteer and ad hoc fire department by Kofi Annan, uh, it's, it's a messy procedure. And the key takeaway that I wanna emphasize here is that um, there's a lot of discretion on uh, the part of contributing countries in deciding when and how and with whom to uh, deploy troops and contribute troops, and also obviously to uh, withdraw them. Um, so uh, to answer if there are electoral cycles in countries' troop uh, deployments, I construct a dyadic contributor by conflict uh, by month uh, panel. So I follow each internal armed conflict with peacekeepers present between 1990 and 2019 from the outset uh, of the conflict to 24 months after the conflict has become inactive, basically following the civil war literature here. So I measure conflict intensity uh, primarily by uh, the num monthly number of battle-related fatalities uh, uh, using data from the Uppsala conflict data program. I match on monthly data on troop contributions from each contributing country to uh, host country uh, and mission. And I count national elections in democratic countries uh, defined as scoring uh, above five in the polity five index, uh, uh, the conventional cutoff uh, in, in the literature here in defining a democracy. And uh, countries that contribute uh, non-trivially to, to these missions, so 100 troops or more, to a conflict on a different continent to get closer to a situation where this political economy log logic is more likely to hold. So less likely to pose a direct and salient uh, security threat to the contributor. Um, so I take this um, uh, uh, dyadic panel and estimate the, the equation you see on the screen here. So essentially regressing the number of troop units of 100 uh, troops in each um, uh, deployed by contributor C to mission conflict M in month T. I regress that on a, a dummy indicating if contributor C in much, in month T, it's a uh, Q quarters away from elections. So essentially quarterly election dummy variables. I control for a year and calendar month fixed effects and most crucially uh, contributor and mission uh, conflict fixed effects, the unit of analysis in my panel. So this um, uh, uh, fixed effects, uh, uh, eta subscript CM here implies that the variation uh, that I'm using to estimate the effect of election solely comes from temporal variation within contributor conflict periods, right? So uh, just a, a quick preview of, of, of the sample that I have that, I, that are driving the main results. So there's 28 democratic and distant contributors in my sample, most of those being OECD countries. They contribute to uh, a total of 25 conflicts in, in the post-Cold War era, most of those being in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. In total, there's 97 contributor conflict dyads in, in, in the sample. And I use uh, uh, 76 national elections. Uh, all right, so uh, the first part of the paper, um, uh, we have the results here. So this is um, uh, a, a dummy for any troops deployed a particular month regressed on the, the election variable I just described. So we can see that the probability of having any troops deployed decreases by up to 13 percentage points uh, as, uh, ar around national elections. We can do the same exercise uh, in, in a different uh, uh, model specification using a linear version of the number of troop units deployed or a proportional version, the log, uh, log linear version. So these imply uh, a decrease of 125 troops around elections or, or a decrease of uh, 20% from the mean. 
So I can also show you a, a Poisson pseudo uh, maximum likelihood version of these, and they are uh, consistent. All right, so having established um, electoral cycles and contributions, I move on to try to answer whether or not this affects mission performance and, and conflict outcomes. And to do this, I collapse the panel to the level of mission conflict M and month T. And then I aggregate uh, the election variable to this level. So um, uh, illustrated here in, in, um, in equation two, uh, this basically means that for each month in each mission conflict, I count the number of troop contributing countries that have a national election out of a pool of troop contributors to that specific mission, I denote as C subscript M here. And in the analysis, I will vary uh, this pool C subscript M uh, primarily regarding the size of the country's uh, troop contributions to, con to proxy for the importance of, of contributors to each mission. So I take this independent variable uh, uh, into equation uh, three here, which basically uh, estimating a reduced form effect of electoral cycles or elections on conflict-related fatalities. So the dependent variable here being conflict-related fatalities month T in mission conflict M, and uh, the in main independent variable being on number of ongoing elections in, in a group of uh, contributing countries. Jacob, uh, five more yeah. minutes. Yeah, sure. So uh, uh, crucially, uh, I, I'm controlling for uh, mission conflict fixed effects here. So implying that identifying variation comes from the timing of elections within conflicts, right? So um, relying on the assumption that election timing among distant democracies that contribute above a certain threshold is exogenous to conflict dynamics, right? Which I, I believe is possible. So um, uh, the main results of this reduced form relationship can be illustrated in this graph. So in the top left one here, you see uh, any battle related fatalities a particular month would rest on this uh, uh, election variable that I showed you. So we can sh see here that elections in all contributing countries to emission uh, does not seem to have a, a clear impact. But as we move um, up the distribution in terms of contributor importance defined as uh, the number of troops deployed to these missions, we can see that in the top quartile contributors, uh, those that contribute more than uh, 890 troops in my sample, elections in those countries uh, really seems to increase uh, the number of uh, the, the risk for any battle related deaths by uh, around 25 percentage points. Uh, and also in the proportional version that the, 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 the percentage of um, uh, battle related fatalities in, in these conflicts increased by a staggering 100% from a mean of 45 battle related fatalities in my sample. All right, so these uh, results in both uh, parts of the paper are generally robust. I can drop each year contributor mission or mission country with not much happening, bootstrap standard errors uh, and cluster on conflict or manipulate the time window in which I follow, uh, follow the conflicts. Okay, so uh, what does this mean? Um, what drives the effect of elections in troop contributing countries on conflicts. So the potential main story here uh, is I believe that election induced troop decreases are perhaps not compensated for by the rest of the international community, leading to a decreased mission capacity. And if UN peacekeeping is, uh, is really uh, mitigating conflict, it, it, it would um, increase conflict fatalities. And I find uh, in, in uh, two extra uh, anal uh, analyses in, in the paper support for the story. First, there seems to be a negative spillover of elections so that uh, elections in other contributors uh, uh, and, and uh, mainly large other contributors, uh, perhaps the leading contributors to a mission seems to decrease the probability that you yourself are uh, uh, deploying troops. And uh, second election, uh, primarily in large contributors seems to decrease the total troops on the ground in these missions and the probability that the mission is even uh, deployed. However, so, so that would speak in favor of the fact that troop deployments on the ground is the main story here uh, that is really um, driving the, the reduced form relationship between electoral cycles and, and conflict fatalities. But you, you could think of alternatives here. So perhaps it could be a, 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 um, a shift 
also in other instruments of foreign influence. So there's a long list here, obviously. You can see that countries could uh, alter aid, mediation efforts, sanctions, informal political talks, or, or what have you. So I explore uh, one main potential candidate in the paper where I look at flows of aid and humanitarian assistance, but I find no evidence that this is altered, really. Uh, there's also the possibility that competence might endogenously respond to an upcoming election in a, in a distant contributing country. That's yet to be tested, so this is all um, work in progress here. But if we are to believe that you know, deployments is the main story at play here and the, and the main mechanism, this would suggest the two uh, bottom points here, that timely and adequately sized UN peacekeeping operations reduce battlefield violence on average, and that electoral concerns uh, in, in troops and in countries can severely hamper international collective action to mitigate conflict. So in the last uh, half minute or so, I, I can just mention where I placed this in the literature. Uh, four literatures, basically, uh, I believe I contribute to. So the first one, obviously, political economy literature on electoral cycles, connecting it to foreign policy and UN peacekeeping specifically. Second, the political economy of peacekeeping and conflict mitigation, really pinpointing domestic electoral concerns as an impediment to contributions to uh, peacekeeping. And third, if we are to believe that deployments drive this, uh, it really is indirect evidence that uh, UN peacekeepers um, are uh, effective at mitigating, or, or uh, at least uh, in, this, uh, in this setting mitigates uh, uh, conflict intensity. And fourth, uh, more generally to, to uh, a, a literature on trying to understand contributions of countries to a global public goods in general, where you can think of similar logics applying to other global public goods, such as uh, climate change mitigation efforts, for example. So uh, I'll end there and th say uh, thank you for listening. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, Jacob. That was great and perfectly on time. So thank you. Uh, we're going to move to Marie Christelle, who's going to talk to us about colonial, colonial origins and fertility. Go ahead. Okay. And I'll tell, tell you when you have five minutes left. So you can see my screen now? Uh, yes. Okay, thank you. So um, thanks everyone for joining this session. Uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about some uh, work I've been uh, doing on this persistent impact of uh, colonial and pre-colonial institutions on women's health in Africa. So the paper I'm presenting uh, focuses on the colonial origins on, of fertility in Africa. So I will start off uh, by just showing you two figures that I think shape a lot of my, uh, of my current research agenda. So what we are looking at on the left is the cross countries distribution of fertility rates across Africa, along with some regional average uh, that are coming uh, from uh, the World Bank data in 2017. So essentially uh, what this figure is showing is that fertility rates in Africa remains very high and this is despite uh, you know, large improvements in uh, human capital outcomes that we observe in the region. And, uh, but this figure is also uh, showing important cross countries variation in fertility rates. And it seems that certain countries, mostly Anglophone speaking countries are very advanced in the demographic transition while others, mainly Francophone speaking countries have barely started the transition. So, I also look at, uh, on, the, uh, on the right, I look at fertility trends separately across African countries colonized by France and countries colonized by uh, Great Britain. And on this figure, we uh, draw the trend uh, in fertility uh, since 1916. The blue line represents French colonies, uh, former French colonies, and the red, uh, former British colonies. And not surprisingly, uh, this figure shows that across the region, fertility rate is uh, decreased as, as decreased. But what I think is quite striking to me is the great uh, divergence between former British and French colonies uh, in terms of the level. So we see here that fertility rate uh, has decreased, but it has decreased at a slower pace in former French colonies compared to former British colonies. So as an economist, this is very striking to me, uh, and it sort of shapes the um, questions that I am asking in this paper, which is basically, uh, trying to understand whether and how colonial institutions shape uh, fertility behavior in Africa. 
So we try to uh, uh, pin down whether this, this, this relationship can be causal or not. But we also go beyond that uh, by uh, trying to understand uh, whether we can do something to mitigate any impact of uh, colonial institutions that we will observe, observe uh, in the paper. So uh, before I go into the uh, main empirical analysis, I just wanted to, to, to spend a little bit of time uh, to show you why we believe colonial origins might have uh, a persistent impact on fertility outcomes. So historically, uh, the, the, the pool, there is a contrast between, uh, in terms of colonial population policies uh, implemented in former British and French, in former French colonies. The pronatalist policies in former uh, French colonies can be opposed to uh, the more liberal culture of reproductive rights uh, in former British colonies. Concretely, in, in France, um, the heavy deficit in birth uh, caused by uh, the First World War has led to an adoption of um, a pronatalist law called the Law of 1920 that essentially uh, prohibited any propaganda on contraceptive use and severely repressed abortion. But what is interesting is that uh, the French, this French pronatalist law was extended to the colonies, meaning that the law was also introduced and enforced in former French colonies. And more importantly, uh, the law remained in application in all former French colonies in Africa, even after the independence. And when you look at those countries, you will see that it is just uh, starting, it's just recently in the 1980s that the French pronatalist law was repealed and that we started seeing a national family planning uh, program uh, gradually appeared uh, in former French colonies. So this is in contrast with uh, former British colonies where policies to control population growth emerged much earlier, uh, starting uh, in the uh, 1950s. And this is uh, after uh, we have seen an introduction of population control policies in the British Empire simply because they wanted to uh, avoid political discontent due to uh, population growth in the, uh, in the colonies. So we use the, this uh, timing of uh, the, uh, these historical events uh, to uh, show that on this graph, uh, to clearly show that we have a difference in the timing of the implementation of family planning uh, programs in former British and French colonies. And as we, we can see that British colonies were the first in Africa to implement family planning programs. And that was almost 20 years before these programs were introduced in former French colonies. And I will exploit this time variation uh, in the empirical analysis to provide evidence that uh, British French differences in fertility can be linked to uh, differences in colonial population policies. So what we do uh, in, the, the, uh, in terms of empirical approach, we use uh, several data, uh, but we mainly focus on uh, the demographic and health survey, and uh, we link this individual data with uh, uh, historical data on ancestral ethnic group in Africa. And our strategy uh, rely on a, uh, on the natural experiment that occurred during the scramble for Africa. Basically, after uh, the Berlin conference, we had uh, this random division of Africa, uh, which, uh, uh, which led to a division of, or a partition of pre-colonial ethnic groups in Africa across different colonizers. So we use this uh, setup to implement a regression discontinuity design. So here the map shows uh, how these uh, show the partition basically of Africa across different ethnic, uh, different uh, colonizers. So in black, we have the ancestral ethnic homeland and in the red lines and um, our former British colonies and the blue line represent former French colonies. And our regression discontinuity strategy will uh, focus on the British French borders and compare women in the same ethnic homeland, but who are living on different sides of the border. And the benefits of this strategy is simply that it will help us account uh, for several differences, uh, cultural differences, geographic differences that could matter for the uh, outcome of interest. So basically, uh, the strategy is summarized in this equation, which is uh, a common, which is common in the RG literature. Uh, for the sake of the time, I will not go. I will go directly uh, into the result. But basically, we just regress uh, an outcome 
on a dummy for whether uh, the individual reside on the British or the French side, and we introduce uh, a bunch of uh, uh, controls. Uh, but the main control here is the ethnic homeland fixed effect, which, as I mentioned, allows us to control for uh, cultural background. So what do we find? Our main finding uh, regarding the, the effect of British colonization on fertility is shown, is shown in this RG graph where we draw on the x-axis our um, running variable, which, measure, which is measured by the distance to the British French border. The negative value uh, represents French areas and positive value are British areas. So each dot represents the average estimate within two kilometers being of uh, the distance to the British French border. And over the dot, we also we have uh, we draw a fitted linear function. As you can see, uh, the jump at the border indicates uh, here that women in former British colonies have fewer uh, children compared to uh, francophone women. And this result is uh, confirmed uh, in the uh, regression setting, uh, where we we find that the point we find that the effect of um, of British colonization on fertility is actually uh, is significant. So uh, women, Anglophone women, seems to have uh, significantly fewer children uh, compared to uh, Francophone women. And we, um, so now that we have uh, shown this causal impact of British colonization or colonial origins on fertility, we wanted to show uh, or to provide evidence about the claim that these differences is explained or is entirely driven by differences in colonial population policies. I mentioned earlier, I, uh, I showed earlier this, uh, map, this graph about uh, the introduction of family planning policies in uh, former British colonies in Africa. So I exploit the timing uh, of the introduction of these population policies to run an event study analysis showing how the British French uh, fertility gap evolved following the introduction of uh, family planning policies. So exploiting the variation uh, or exploiting variation in exposure to the policy across different cohorts, we have uh, we obtain this uh, event study analysis, which shows no statistically uh, significant differences uh, in fertility prior to the introduction of family planning policies in both British and French colonies. But that right after uh, we have the introduction of uh, the family planning policies in the British colonies we can see that the fertility gap appeared and increased significantly uh, between the period uh, zero, uh, which is when we introduced family planning policies in former British colonies, and the uh, period at which uh, French colonies start implementing those policies. And start, uh, at this time, then, the gap gradually decreased and almost disappeared. Uh, um, yes, and almost disappeared, basically. Nice. So yeah. You have five more minutes. Okay, so this finding are uh, also confirmed in same, a bunch of other specifications where we find uh, the, the, that the effect, the fertility effect of British colonization is negative and significant until francophone women are exposed to family planning uh, programs. So quickly, uh, I want to touch base a bit on the, uh, the second part of the paper where we try to understand uh, when we try to answer the question whether we can do something to mitigate uh, this effect or uh, this long term effect of uh, British colonization. So the, the question uh, is whether certain policies can be implemented to modify the long term impact of history. In the context of this paper, we look at market access as a possible policy instrument that will help mitigate uh, the, this impact. Market access is interesting because we all know that market access lower uh, fertility demand because of an increase in the opportunity cost of having children. And uh, we'll argue that if this effect, this market effect is high enough, it could counterbalance or offset the effect of colonial origins on fertility. And we test that uh, by, by implementing an heterogeneous analysis where uh, we, com we compare the effect within uh, area with high market access and area with low market access. So the result uh, here, we display the result. And uh, as you can see, when we, we split the sample, the jump at the border that we observe is only present in areas with low market access. Why in area with high market access, uh, the effect is, quite, is uh, actually null. Uh, 
So that's, uh, we, in the paper, we try also to provide a better evidence of this effect into uh, a regression settings where we uh, control for difference in uh, the distribution of ethnic group across the two, uh, the two areas. And we find a quite robust uh, result showing that the, um, uh, co the, the, that colonial origin affects fertility only in areas with lower market access. So, so in terms of, uh, uh, quickly in terms of the mechanism, we, we try to uh, understand what is, how the effect persists uh, uh, currently. So what, what are the potential um, channel of persistence basically? And our main story is through this uh, impact on the uh, use of modern methods of, of, uh, of birth control. So we also use the heterogeneous analysis to try to see whether we have evidence that support this channel of persistence. The objective behind that, we wanted to see whether the heterogeneous effect of colonial origins on contraceptive is uh, consistent with uh, the heterogeneous effect of colonial origins on fertility. And uh, when we use uh, contemporary use, the use of a modern method of birth control as a measure, we can see from this table that uh, the effect of British colonization on the use of modern method of birth control is positive and is, it is much higher in areas with lower market access, which is consistent with the negative impact of British colonization on fertility. So this uh, result tend to support uh, the idea that uh, we, the, the, the main channel or the main story here could be through the, the impact or the um, and a persistence to the use or the contemporary use of modern method of uh, contraception. But we could, there's several other alternative channels that we could think of uh, based on the literature. We can think of uh, the difference uh, across uh, education policies, uh, uh, the, in, the impact on, uh, of colonial origins on female labor participation. But we uh, also use this heterogeneous analysis that I use for contraception use to show that uh, those channels are less likely to uh, drive our results. And uh, if I can, uh, so for the sake of the time, I think I will briefly conclude here uh, by giving you uh, some details on how this paper contribute to the literature. So we, we mainly contribute uh, to the extent literature on the historical origins of, of economic development. And uh, we, contribute, we add to this literature by looking at the role of uh, colonial population policies, a component that has been overlooked in the literature. And we also provide uh, this uh, evidence about the heterogeneous impact uh, of the long-term effect of uh, colonial origins on fertility. So we, uh, we found basically that uh, the effect of colonial origins on fertility do not persist equally everywhere. Uh, the effect actually disappear once we correct uh, for market access. So uh, I think I will stop here uh, since I'm running out of time, but uh, please uh, feel free to ask me a question. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Mike Christelle. Uh, we now we're gonna move to uh, Adil and again, I'll tell you when you have five minutes left, that's okay. Okay, uh, let me just share my screen quickly. All right, so this is um, essentially a paper with, uh, with my quarter, Rinchen Mirza. And um, it basically looks at the impact of historic elites on development in the context of dynastic politics. Uh, the basic motivation for our work is that a lot of work that establishes the relationship between institutions and development depends on the importance of historic elites, that, you know, they're sort of elites um, and their persistence is crucial to understanding the impact of um, institutions on development. Um, we do have quite a bit of impact, uh, 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 sort of literature that talks about the impact of elites on development. Uh, so there's work by Engerman, Sokolov, Robinson, Naidu et al. Um, but a lot of this literature sort of skirts the role of politics as an intermediating channel, right? So if historical elites persist, they probably persist more in politics and through that channel, they influence development. But the impact of the role of politics is sort of understated in this literature. And a classic example is an excellent paper by uh, Essie Mogru et al, which is uh, 
based on the role of uh, tribal chiefs in Africa. Um, and it talks about how uh, chiefdoms with fewer ruling families uh, tend to have lower development outcomes today. And it sort of implies that because in these regions where chiefs have um, achieved terms with the fewer ruling families uh, actually have lower political competition. Um, some primary evidence are presented on that, but uh, it's sort of under specified um, uh, dimension. So we know that politics is important as an intervening mechanism uh, because a lot of these elites uh, control uh, as state resources and institutions, and it's through that mechanism that they tend to influence development. What we um, do in this paper is sort of ask uh, three interrelated questions. The first is, um, is, is really about whether or not historically recognized elites, in our context, these are very much tribal elites, um, whether or not they shape local development, and uh, whether political persistence of these elites is an important intervening channel. And a question that we are still continuing to explore is the role that social networks uh, play in this process, which is to say, are these elites more, uh, have more expanded networks on the political domain? Are they more likely to be dynastic? Um, so what this paper does in terms of sort of empirical framework is its first contribution is to sort of uh, develop an extensive database on political genealogies. And we empirically combine that with a close election regression discontinuity framework. Um, we use that framework to test how exposure to members of historically recognized tribal families shape development. Uh, we find that areas that are narrowly elected tribal elite perform worse on a range of development outcomes uh, compared to regions where you know, the narrowly elected non-tribal elite. Um, the key development outcomes we look at, one is a standard one, which is growth in nighttime luminosity, but we also leverage uh, a novel database on um, household level database on attendance in schools, you know, out of school children and also asset ownership. And we find that um, those development outcomes are also lower, lower in these, uh, re these regions. We also then begin to explore possible mechanisms. Um, we argue that these elites, these historic elites, are, uh, come from more traditional families. They're embedded in more hierarchical relations where forms of social control are more um, dominating. Um, but they tend to uh, ex assert their influence on, on, on development through their persistence in political power. And we show that this matters because through that persistence, they're able to control um, uh, the state, they act as gatekeepers of the state, and in that capacity manipulate local development. But some of the work on mechanisms is still ongoing, and we are beginning to, uh, uh, to collect data on that. So here's the classic sort of uh, regression discontinuity specification for shortage of time. I'm not going to go through um, uh, this specification in, in much detail, except to note that um, our, our main sort of uh, variable here is the sort of um, uh, the tribe vote margin is the sort of difference in vote shares. So we're really looking at the tribe vote margin. Um, we use the kernel weighted local linear regression. Um, and we also sort of control for a number of factors, particularly candidate level characteristics. Um, uh, and we cluster the standard errors at the constituency level. Now, a key contribution to this paper is to collect a really fine-grained database of political genealogies that actually goes a century back and covers almost a 100-year period uh, from 1921. That was the year when the British opened the door for electoral politics. Now, um, a lot of that data uh, required us to combine both archival data, which will tell us which elites are tribal and historically recognized, and it also required um, you know, knowledge through biographies, through a whole range of other data sources on who's related to whom and how many elections they run and when do they run elections, when do they enter in, in politics. So very, very fine-grained data. Um, in terms of election data, it, all of it comes from, um, uh, from, from publicly available sources. The two sort of assembly elections in Pakistani Punjab, uh, the national and provincial assembly elections that we focus on, um, these general elections really started in 1970, and we focus on three most recent rounds, 2002, 8, and 13, um, for which we can easily get the shape files 
uh, for these different constituencies. So we are then going to look at union council level analysis. And union council is a um, is one step below tehsil. So it's usually district tehsil and then union council, uh, which is a smaller, more fine grained unit of geographic analysis. Uh, as I mentioned, in terms of development outcomes, we are looking at really the nighttime luminosity, uh, and we would look at the growth in nighttime luminosity during the electoral cycle. Um, and we use the sort of latest, um, uh, uh, you know, methods in terms of constructing this data, uh, especially the visible infrared imaging radiometer suite, uh, the VIIRS um, uh, a data set, which is, uh, which the literature suggests is, is more preferable. Um, in terms of additional indicators, we have uh, access to uh, data on the Benazir Income Support Program, uh, 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 household level data, which is a very large data set covering around 15 million households, and it provides basic information about out of school children um, and the basic assets, whether you can have a refrigerator or a car or, you know, all these different sort of rural and urban assets. Uh, so we construct an indicator of those assets. Unfortunately, we cannot uh, use these indicators in terms of growth because we don't know how much uh, growth has taken place during the electoral cycle, but we will try and use these indicators after the electoral uh, period. Uh, so we'll only restrict that level of analysis to 2002 and eight because this data was collected in about 2011 and 12. Okay, so the first key uh, issue is to look at you know what we are what we are really saying our tribe variable um, are is is really tribes and chiefs or major clans of Punjab, um, and our main data source is the sort of district level gazetteers of British India, uh, it, which provided a lot of information about um, the sort of leading families and tribes of Punjab. Um, for those who are aware of pa uh, Pakistan's political economy, especially of Punjab, know of this very famous book, Griffin and Macy's book, it's known as Chiefs and Families of Note in the Punjab. A lot of these tribes uh, who were uh, recognized in those books uh, were also then designated as agricultural costs, and they became fit to receive landed gentry grants. But these were basically families who were uh, heads of those clans. Right, um, and so they're very, very powerful, and they derive their authority um, uh, in, in traditional through their traditional uh, uh, mechanisms. Here is a, an image of the book "Chiefs and Families of Note in the Punjab," a slightly blurry image, but um, uh, this is this book is widely available. We got hold of it in Oxford, um, and it has a lot of detailed information about the many different. Uh, tribes and who were the chief tribes. And now for us, it was important to, to connect these chiefs with their progenies over time so that a chief that is appearing in this book can be connected with his sons and daughters and, 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 and several generations uh, so that we can track their presence in electoral politics over time. Uh, in terms of district gazetteers, here is an image from uh, uh, from the Multan, which is one of the major districts in south of Punjab, and you could see how, you know, uh, it's written here: tribes, castes, and leading families. Here, it's describing uh, the Sayyid families, which is, who derive their power from religious shrines, um, and you could see how this is a major family, a major shrine, Musa Pak Shahid, and there are lots of individuals who are connected to this. Um, similarly, there's the Sayyids of Bijapur, Sayyids of Jalalpur, Pirwala. There are a lot of these major families that are recognized these district gazetteers. Now the task for us was to connect these families with their later day uh, generations and track their presence in politics. You similar, have five more minutes. Okay, okay. And a similar similar such structure you can find in, in some of these. Um, here is, the, is a preview of our data. So here is the Lighari families, one of the biggest uh, dynasties in, in uh, South Punjab. And they have been in politics for a long period of time, about winning around 79 elections. They have been in politics from 1921 all the way down to the present assembly. Um, similarly, here is a biographical chart of the Gilani family. You again find a lot of persistence. So we want to use this data and ask whether regions where uh, you know these tribal families narrowly win over non-tribal families, uh, what is the impact on development? Now, 
very quickly about the context, we are really talking about a context where tribal elites have hierarchical forms of control. Uh, they're more incentivized to undermine development. But two key aspects that are important to consider is that they are their power is not assured. Over time, their power has transformed from domination to intermediation. In other words, they have to constantly take part in politics, control the state, and provide mediating access to the local populations, right? And so you're really talking about highly localized competition. I'm going to skip these, uh, you know, uh, these uh, summary statistics. We're broadly speaking, about 718 families we identified as dynasties. 129 of those are categorized as tribal, uh, which I recognize in the district as a tier. Here are some initial patterns. Um, very quickly, the key result that we find here is that, um, you know, this is clearly um, uh, comparing the sample of union councils that are in constituencies where a tribal elite narrowly won to union councils where a tribal elite narrowly lost. And as you would see, the RD bandwidth is allowed to vary. Um, yet we find a negative and statistically significant effect, which is that if a, in, in, in constituencies where they narrowly win um, over, over non-tribal leads, development is lower. Uh, here is a pictorial representation on nighttime luminosity. Um, uh, then we do the sort of standard battery of tests that are now um, uh, relevant in the literature, whether or not there was a discontinuity in other uh, indicators, railroad density, waterway density, nightlights growth in the pre-period, uh, 92 to 2002, none of these uh, really uh, are relevant. Um, in fact, if you look at the proximity to urban areas, which is a key, which could be a key determinant for some of these differences, um, there's, there's, a re there, there's no discontinuity at all on that. Uh, similarly, growth in nighttime luminosity in the pre-period, no discontinuity. Um, and then we do the sort of standard uh, 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 things like a lot of these candidate level characteristics, secondary education, agriculture, et cetera. Uh, McCreary test for discontinuity in the running variable. Um, we change the alternative bandwidths, right? So do a lot of uh, cutoffs. Uh, we do the donut hole analysis. All of these things sort of pass. And we also find um, the hint of an evidence that there's greater proportion of out school children um, in, in regions uh, where, where tribal elites are win by a narrow margin and, and lower asset ownership in those regions. In terms of mechanisms, I'll now close by just saying one thing, which is that a lot of this mechanism really comes through their persistence in politics and through their continued access to the state. Um, there's a lot of qualitative evidence that is available on how that access to the state is important for these um, oligarchs. Um, and um, so, so we present that evidence and then we show a very sharp discontinuity in family tenures. In fact, tribal families seem to have higher family tenures compared to non-tribal uh, uh, you know, in, in, in these other regions uh, where, they, where they narrowly lost uh, to a non-tribal elite. So it seems like they are really more persistent in politics. And one of the things we are now looking at is whether or not they have larger set of networks, social networks, a greater presence in other constituencies, larger clan uh, networks, which might uh, explain uh, for their um, greater tenures. So that's that's the basic sense of it. We also find some survey level evidence on how in these regions, uh, the voting decisions tend to be based more on the opinion of tribal chiefs, past development projects matter less, and assistance with police and courts is quite crucial uh, for these for these elites. So overall, um, we find that um, you know historic these historic tribal elites were relatively incentivized to undermine development, tend to to matter, and political persistence is one of the key mechanisms through which this takes place. So the paper really tries to bring these two distinct literatures: the literature on um, historical institutionalism and development, and the literature on dynastic politics in direct conversation with each other. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, Adil. Uh, perfectly on time as well. And so now we can move on to Felix, who's going to talk to us about uh, businessmen and politicians in Mozambique. Great. Thanks. Um, thanks for organizing this panel, and thanks for uh, the other discussions. I've already learned a lot. Um, 
Yeah, in this paper, we uh, this is joint work with uh, Finn Top and uh, Sam Jones from the University of Copenhagen. My name is Felix. I'm a PhD student at the Copenhagen Business School. And in this paper, we look at the personal returns of political mandates in, in Mozambique. Um, I think no one in political economy needs to be convinced that there's a strong relation between economic and political power, uh, especially in developing countries. Um, Nevertheless, we don't really have a proper micro-based foundation in most country cases. Um, so there's a lot of uh, qualitative uh, research, but we don't really know on a quantitative level um, how exactly, what's the magnitude of, 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 of returns. Um, and that's especially true in very low uh, state capacity settings like Mozambique. Um, yeah, and um, you can also put a number on the relevance of this topic if you want to. The UN estimates that 3.7% uh, of uh, average African countries' GDP goes lost due to illicit flows. Um, however, not all illicit business activities are necessarily illicit, especially in a low income setting, because there could be just a simple necessary to do uh, business as to compensate for an, uh, formal taxation or something which is not given by sick capacity. Um, and we look at this, the relationship between political power and economic power in the context of Mozambique. Um, this, this case is particular, uh, suitable for such a study. Um, let me walk you through the history of Mozambique really quick. Um, the country got independent quite late and you, I, okay, sorry. This, and, um, from Portuguese rule and uh, 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 the freedom movement that led the struggle for independence for Limo became the ruling power. And that ruling elite is in power until today. And that setup allows us to study a consistent homogeneous uh, elite at the very top of the country um, over the entire period. Um, and even though there were various economic transformations uh, and political events, the same elite state in power. So right after independence, there was a, um, a civil uh, war and uh, the country began as a socialist movement uh, and as a socialist country, um, but they um, began to implement market-based reforms in the uh, mid eighties uh, with structural adjustment programs. Um, they also institutionalized formally. They had their first elections in 94. They found the peace agreement uh, and around 2000, um, uh, development aid increased significant um, to Mozambique. Um, the country had for a long time the reputation of a donor darling. Um, and in 2009, there was a large discovery of natural gas in the northern province, uh, Cabo Delgado, uh, which led to a large inflow of, of foreign capital uh, at that time. And then recently, there is an ongoing struggle in uh, Cabo Delgado, where the gas was uh, found related to Islamist terror. Um, but nevertheless, uh, Frelimo is in power until today. So what I want to show you here is that we have a clear setup where first the political elite emerged, Frelimo, and then the private sector was established. And due to the absolute level of poverty in Mozambique, the private sector emerged after the political elite. So we first have our political institutions and then we have a private sector. And in that setup, uh, we ask a pretty Straightforward question, do politically exposed persons experience faster growth in their business networks than non-PEPs? The term PEP is from financial regulations. So banks uh, and other institutions need to check whether their clients have political motives. Uh, and that's what you do with PEP checks, what ban banks have to do. Um, there's not a consistent definition of a PEP. Um, we focus here on really high level political mandates. So we look at ministers, vice ministers, governors, presidents, um, and individuals that have powerful positions in the party. Uh, as I mentioned, Frelimo has some socialist rules, and that's why the party continues to vote their central committee and they have a Politburo. And we use these um, mandates to identify the very top of political elites in the country uh, and review their uh, economic performance in the private sector of Mozambique since independence. Um, so in a quick summary, what we do, we, we, we contribute um, novel data, both for political mandates and for firms. Uh, I think the, the firm point here is really the, the unique contribution that we do. Um, and we're going to use network centrality uh, to estimate the personal power in the private sector 
I will explain in a second why we're doing this. Um, and then that setup, we can look at the personal returns of individuals over 35 years. Uh, we choose this period because um, yeah, before that, there was hardly any private sector doing the, um, doing the civil war. Uh, and that's why um, it was pointless to start earlier. Um, and you're probably not too surprised to hear that we do find a significant positive effect from becoming a political PEP. So if you become a PEP, then you uh, grow your business network faster than very similar individuals who didn't become a politician in a powerful position. Um, yes. So our data um, consists of both um, uh, firm registration, that's here a copy on the left hand side of what we use, and of political mandates. Um, let me talk about um, the, the, the private sector registration firms. So obviously, it's pretty difficult to, um, to, um, to, to, to collect firm data from a country like Mozambique. Uh, and that's why we use uh, a, a data parsing approach. So this publication here, the Bulletin de la Republica, is inherited from colonial rule. Uh, it registers every formal business that's that registered in Mozambique. You might wonder why should I register my firm in Mozambique? Well, if you want to have access to a bank account uh, that has access to the SWIFT system, then you need to have some kind of formalization. That's why all somewhat important firms who have any kind of international transactions are definitely listed here. Um, and we're actually confident that the, the, um, the register registers even more than that. Um, to get this data, we bought a subscription from a, uh, sorry, from a, uh, from a accounting company in Mozambique. They basically just digitized that manually um, into a, a web service, and we scraped this web service um, to get all formal entries. And through that, we get all private firms, but also NGOs and parties and all kinds of formal information. Um, and that's a pretty rich resource. And uh, just to illustrate you what we what we get to the private sector. So these are the annual registered firms um, per year. I start here in 2000 because before that there was hardly any business activity. Um, and then we can use natural language processing and other data science techniques to, uh, to identify the industry of the firms and uh, define in what kind of industry they're operating. Um, and then just to show you the, the value of this, this efforts, um, our bulletin has around 127,000 entries. Um, and if we compare our firm database to, to the next best uh, firm registry that we could find, which is Orbis in that case, and Orbis has only 10,000 firms. So we find 10 times more firms um, than these um, business intelligence services. So Orbis is a, yeah, it's a business intelligence service that's used in many, yeah, political economy research. Um, and even if we compare this to, to, to survey data, um, like you and your wider or the World Bank, then we have obviously way more um, observations than, than survey data would have. So we really have on a micro level, all personal business affiliations. We have around 100,000 uh, business owners in that register. Um, and then we map through fuzzy matching um, political mandates that we also collected by hand. Um, so ministers, vice, I think I said that's already right. Ministers, vice ministers, governors, um, and all these like really high top level um, politicians. Uh, and then we identify their, uh, their business performance over time. There's one important limitation that comes with the data, and that's a missing uh, outcome variable because we only know what kind of register, what kind of firm you register, um, but firms can make wins or losses, so it's hard to estimate your personal gains uh, directly from from just the number of firms that you register. And to deal with this challenge, we estimate the social capital of uh, an individual in the private sector through uh, network centrality measures. Um, there are two measures that we think are particularly suitable in the private sector. They are from, from Jackson, and I think they're becoming clear if we look at this sandbox example here. So consider the, the case of a, of a very simple uh, network where individuals who are shareholders in the same firm are connected by an edge. And uh, through that simple logic, we can just build this, this network. Um, and then the logic of the godfather centrality is that you are the unique contact for two individuals. So if 
individual A and individual G wants to, they want to share any kind of information or do any kind of a transaction, then their contact is E because E works with both of them and uh, he or she is the exclusive access to, to uh, this, this connection here. While B Felix, and- Sorry, Felix, you yes. have five more minutes. Yes, thanks, oh, sorry, okay. And B and F um, don't depend on E here because they, um, they are uh, direct business partners. And then the case centrality is a bit, uh, yeah, it's a different measure um, where you basically just look at uh, the, yeah, how spread your, your network is. So in that case here is F, the most powerful network. Um, and we use these network centralities along with the type of firms uh, to estimate your performance in the private sector. Yes, um, our empirical identification is pretty straightforward. We have two-way fixed effects and uh, locked outcome variables, um, locked outcome models. Um, we have a heterogeneous treatment because the point in time when you become minister or any kind of other political powerful person obviously changes. Uh, so we have a heterogeneous treatment um, and we look at growth rates of the outcomes of five-year periods and then we use the inverse hyperbolic sign to deal with all the zeros because a lot of individuals have over a lot of time no business uh, activity before they start. Uh, and then, yeah, since we have this um, heterogeneous treatment, we also use uh, event studies and whatnot. In the interest of time, let me move a bit on. Yeah, that's just uh, the, the outcomes models, as I said. So in a basic setup, when we, have, when we just take the treatment here, we take individual fixed effects, um, one concern here could be that you're, that is just coming at the same time. So let's say you're a powerful person and then you got chosen in a minister department because of your power in the private sector. Um, that's why we're also using uh, outcome variables, uh, like outcome models. Um, and then another concern is, which we probably cannot really solve, but uh, obviously social capital affects both your political career and your private sector um, career. So if you have a college education, then you're probably more likely to be successful in the private sector as well as in politics. Um, that's why we use uh, a lot of uh, sample restrictions. First, we look only at PEPs, so only individuals who become at some point very powerful individuals. And then we also look at what we call switchers. The idea here is to exclude the really, really, really old or first generation of politicians because they might be the founding father of the country and might they might have different uh, different rules might apply to them than for other individuals. Um, yes, let me jump, sorry for my bad management of time. Um, yeah, this is just for the, for the basic setup. Um, we find um, that uh, even switchers, so like the very small uh, sample of uh, PEPs Oh, if you only look at switchers, so PEPs who become the first time PEP after 1985, then we still find that they grow um, their business network 7% five, uh, faster in, in five years than, than individuals who don't become um, treated in a time. Uh, and that applies both for the, the numbers of companies, but also for the graphite centrality outcome that I already mentioned. Um, and yeah, this is the event study. Let me show you one thing, what I think is, is quite convincing that we really indeed find uh, the effect of, of political mandates and that's the disintegration by, by, by family offices. So what we do here is we only look at families and we find that even if you are from, uh, so if one of your family members gets a PEP mandate, then we find that the that your family benefits, but then we also find if your family member leaves office, then your family network centrality or like your outcome variables decrease. And I think that's quite convincing because um, what we don't observe is the death of individuals. So it could be the case that if someone leaves office, that's because they die. So then we can't really explain if the decrease in the uh, private sector is because of their death or because of their lose to direct political power, but here with the family dynasties, it's, it doesn't really, I mean, then the whole family would have had to die. Um, yes, thanks. I, um, I'm done with my five minutes or not? You have 21 seconds. <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah, no, thanks. You can for, take a few more. 
<laughs> no, 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 I think I'm good. No, I, no, I jumped to all. Um, I think that's, that's uh, what I wanted to share. Thanks. Great. Uh, <clears throat> thanks everyone for a very interesting set of, uh, of papers. We have, you know, a fair bit of time for, for comments and discussion. So if you have any uh, questions, you can either write them in the Q&A or raise your hand and then we'll, we'll, call, we'll kind of allow you, we unmute you and then you can ask your question directly. You can obviously ask questions to uh, any of the papers, unfortunately, except to Marcus because he, he needs to uh, disappear now. But uh, everybody else is here. So go ahead. Um, okay, I guess while people think of, of questions, let me maybe kind of uh, start with a with a couple, um, and uh, then we'll, we'll see if we need, need some more. Um, so Felix, I was just kind of, I really, really liked the, what you were doing, and this is kind of uh, obviously something that I do a lot of research on my own, so I think it was kind of, it's quite cool that you're able to put all this data together. I was just wondering why you decided to focus on those kind of centrality measures and kind of why, kind of especially the Godfather centrality, why not something kind of like betweenness or maybe kind of eigenvector as a more kind of uh, closer uh, kind of measures of, of power. I think that would be useful. And maybe if you can also like, I guess you went a little fast, but kind of you explain how you, so you have the data on the individuals, but how do you then and match that to to families to do your kind of your dynasty analysis and whether you're worried about kind of uh, kind of measurement error in those in those matches that would be that would be one set to uh, to get us started and then kind of ideally it would also be interesting to understand so you do your kind of tribal analysis but um, it would be useful to understand what's the what's the control group do you compare out of like tribal to non-tribal including other dynasties or it's kind of tribal to Kind of non-tribal no dynasties, and are the would the results then be different if you kind of looked at kind of dynasties versus kind of non dynasties excluding tribal? So, you know, if uh, maybe Felix, you want to start in an ideal, and then uh, we can move on to the to the other participants. Sure. Thanks. Um, yeah. Uh, good comments. So uh, first, regarding the the network centralities, um, I honestly not sure if we're going to keep it in the paper at this stage. Mm -hmm. um, because we get that quite a lot. Um, I think initially the idea was that uh, I really liked the Jackson paper and I really thought his arguments about why these measures are, so the addition made sense to me that it, like the Godfather centrality makes sense maybe more in a private sector setting compared to, to um, between the centrality. But in the end, they're really strongly correlated. So it doesn't make that much of a difference. Um, so we, yeah, let's we see if we're going to include more common uh, known uh, measures. Um, but yeah, to be honest, I'm not that much of a big fan of the centrality measures anymore. Um, it's kind of a way to deal with the with the constraint that we don't have a proper performance indicator that you would have in a in a different country setting and like money and politics research. Uh, regarding the the tribes, uh, this is just we just compare every family in the private sector. So we just compare family names. Uh, we control for the very, very common family names. So uh, Dos Santos is like a big shot. That's like, we can't use that. Uh, but besides that, we we actually, all the tests we did, it matched. So um, it's a very small private sector. It's only 100,000 individuals in total. Um, all the, I mean, yeah, it could be that we have some average error, but so far we went pretty well with, with just fuzzy, uh, fuzzy string matching. Um, that being said, of course, there is a lot of variation how you clean the data. And that's something where I think that's a bit strange because, I mean, it, there's a lot of not judgment calls, but it's just like, like how strict you, you, you clean this data. And of course, it's not, it's not the Danish CVR register, right? So the, the way you clean that has, has an effect on the, on the data. Um, yeah, sorry if that was not a proper answer, but thanks. Thank you. Uh, Adil? Uh, thank you very much, Julian. Uh, this is a good question. Sorry, I wanted to explain that in the context, but just zoomed past. Um, I mean, essentially, a lot of the constituencies in Punjab um, have dynasts typically running other important political families. 
Uh, there are occasions when they run against newcomers, but by and large, you have you know, different types of families running against one another. In many cases, the competition is between dynasts. And if you were to restrict the analysis to um, sort of tribal families to, to sort of non-dynasts, um, or, or, or sorry, uh, the, for that, we, have, we don't have that much information, but if you were to run a regression, uh, RD regression with dynast versus non dynast category, the results are not very clear and consistent. And it's easy to understand why, because there are a lot of families that have you know, one or two relatives in politics. Um, and many of them are in urban areas. The effect is really with these very large clans, um, you know, these families that are very entrenched um, in the system. And many of them are tribal families. And, and one of the things, as we discussed before, that we're interested in is, is it the case that many of these tribal families um, have relatives outside the, the districts? Uh, are they marrying uh, with other families, right? So there are clearly some families that have like, um, you know, 19 uh, relatives or 24 relatives. You know, there are some with 30 as well. Um, so I think to answer your question, it's not really a distinction between dynasts versus non dynasts and it's a lot more to do with particular kinds of dynasts who are big tribal families deriving their um, their authority from traditional sources uh, versus other dynasties who may not may, may be less entrenched have fewer family tenures uh, and do not have the sort of hierarchical vertical control um, as these tribal families Thank you. Um, any attendee has any questions? Uh, Philippe has a question. Uh, Marie, I was wondering, sorry, Marie or Krista, sorry if I, um, I was wondering if, um, can, you, can you explain a little bit, super interesting paper, um, how much uh, influence, do you know how much influence the, the colonial rulers actually had on a rule level, let's say, like, do you know how much the, the policies, like, can you explain a bit like how much the policies really affected the citizens in, in, in your sample? Okay, th th thank you, uh, Felix, for the question. So uh, based on the historical uh, archives evidence, um, there's, this, there's this law, for example, on the French side, we have this uh, <coughs> law that they passed, and they implement and enforce the law uh, in, uh, in former colonies. And to see how this has actually um, affected the styling life, the lifestyle of the people there, you will see that in former French colonies, uh, within their constitution, they still have this kind of law. And this law was, uh, what, was uh, what the law was doing is simply that you will not see any uh, kind of education or uh, uh, family planning program, basically. National family planning program were not, it was not possible uh, for them to implement the family planning program simply because based on the law, they, uh, this is not possible. So it is banned, simply. So it is just right after, because when we, they started removing, uh, repealing the law in the 1980s, that we have this national, at the national level at least, uh, we see at the national level implementation of this kind of uh, uh, family, national family planning program, uh, uh, education toward um, uh, controlling uh, of, uh, population, those kind of, uh, of policies that they started implemented at the national level. So that is, that is different from what we observe in the, uh, on British colonies where all these kind of policies uh, started right before, even before the, um, uh, the independence, because uh, in Ghana, for instance, you will see that the national family planning program started in the, uh, I think it's 1915. So it kind of, uh, there's kind of a cultural um, difference in uh, between those countries that is uh, clearly linked to what the, colon the, the, the colonizers has uh, set in terms of uh, rule or uh, rule of law uh, that uh, control these uh, population policies, basically. So, yeah, I don't know if I answer your question, but yeah. Any other, any other questions? 
Um, I just wanted to ask uh, Mary um, if she could elaborate a bit more um, the idea of market access. Why do you think market access is such a crucial intervening variable? Well, yeah, uh, absolutely. So we, um, the idea when we, we started this analysis with market access is that we wanted to have uh, a setting that could help us understand whether we can have kind of exogenous economic incentive, basically. And since um, market access here is, um, we view it as this setting where we have uh, more economic opportunities in general for, uh, let's say for, for everyone, especially for women, so they can actually work outside. Uh, if you think about market access as, for instance, access to external uh, market closer to the sea, we have uh, more access to other markets, right? So we have basically more economic opportunities that are, or, uh, that are present there. So we, we think about it in that, uh, in that way, and we wanted to see whether these exogenous forces could counteract the, uh, the forces that are coming from uh, the colonial institutions or the persistence of the colonial institutions. So we wanted to see the interaction between the two forces and see whether we have any changes. So that is what we, why we leverage on market access. And that could give us some kind of um, uh, evidence at least of, of, of what can be done to counteract history because generally we think about history as uh, something that we cannot change. Basically history, uh, history can be seen as deterministic uh, but what we claim in the paper is that we should think about some ways or some uh, policies that will help uh, counteract the effect of history. That's the, the idea that we had in mind. Can I come back again? Um, I mean, I, 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 you know, this is this is interesting, but this begs the question that market access or particularly access to the sea is also a very important dimension in some of in accounting for some of the pre-colonial factors like slavery that Nathan Nam and others have talked about. And he's always controlling for distance of you know, these trade routes or distance to the sea, because these were the transportation routes for slaves as well. Um, and then when you're thinking about market access, there's another important dimension, which, is, which has to do with sort of land-based versus sea-based. And Africa has seen, seen quite a shift over time uh, uh, from land-based routes, which connected Northern to um, uh, Africa, right? So the sort of Middle Eastern parts of Africa with, with interior Africa um, to more sea-based uh, uh, routes. So it's, 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 it would be useful to look at that as well, or, or how would that affect? Uh, I don't know. I mean, we are really talking about history um, and your starting point is colonialism, but there are lots of pre-colonial factors that could have a, that could impinge us Yes, that's a, that's a great point. Uh, so if I just a comment, um, I'm, I'm not sure I will uh, uh, answer your, your 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 question, but if I uh, we we uh, we consider this the fact that it could be it could simply be that our result can be driven by the fact that colonizers they colonize different uh, kind of areas. So we you can think of uh, the uh, possibility that British probably they went uh, on uh, areas in Africa that were maybe closer to the sea intentionally, right? And then that would, would uh, lead to a uh, bias in our result. But that is not uh, what we have in the data. Basically, we try to uh, control for that in a certain way. And uh, when you look at the, 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 the colonies, uh, the areas that we are comparing, those areas are, uh, similar in terms of access to the uh, market. And uh, so that's led us to, to reduce uh, at least the bias that will come from differences uh, in the characteristics of the areas where we have uh, British and former French colonies. And also uh, thinking about these uh, other cultural characteristics that could matter, we also try to um, control for that uh, uh, in the empirical uh, approach. So yeah, that maybe that is how I will jump into your um, comment. But that's good comment, and I think I will uh, try to read a bit more on 
uh, this uh, CPA's, uh, I mean, the other connection that you mentioned. So thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, there's no more. And Ray, so let me ask a question to Jacob. I mean, I really liked uh, the paper and I was just like a couple of things. Is, so you focus on, on national elections. Have you tried to look at kind of other kind of politically relevant elections? In some countries, even like local elections might be quite politically salient and people don't want to have kind of those kind of negative shocks going from, from somewhere else. So maybe that's something you might want to, to talk about. And to, maybe to kind of better understand that. So I was also quite surprised in a sense that in a way countries kind of think of those, uh, they only send troops if other countries are sending troops. That's what your results seem to suggest, right? If if one country stops sending troops, the other country also stops sending them, which is kind of makes the effect kind of larger. And I actually I would have thought it would be the countries would kind of compensate for each other. So I think that's useful to find. But uh, to look at the effect of kind of troops on conflict, I was wondering whether you had some ways of thinking about maybe doing kind of like interaction analysis potentially where you think of places where conflicts was more likely to happen. Because I'm guessing in, in some of those places, the US peacekeeping mission comes and then things get stable and there's not a lot of conflict. And so removing a few troops might not have a large effect, but you might be in situations where there might be more kind of underlying potential for conflict. And so in those places, removing troops might have a, a larger effect. And so I'm just wondering whether there's anything you can do to try to kind of get at, get at that in a sense. Right, well, interesting. <laughs> Uh, questions, indeed. Um, so local elections in troop sending countries specifically. So right now I've, I've thrown those out. I only look at, you know, the main and uh, national elections where the office of the incumbent power is, um, is uh, uh, up for election. So for example, I throw away midterm elections in, in the US context, for example, I could look specifically at those. My prior would be that, you know, it's all, usually the executive power, uh, mainly who's uh, making the calls for, for these uh, uh, contributions. But you could imagine midterm elections, for example, uh, having an effect. Sample size is not huge. So I'm a little wary uh, actually of, of um, trying too many hypotheses. This was my original idea. And then uh, of course uh, there is huge heterogeneity in terms of how you know the internal pol political logic applies within each country. Um, so it's uh, it's one of the suggestions I'm, I'm uh, good suggestions I'm going to add to the list and think about whether or not to kind of run through the data. Um, what uh, the other question was about heterogene uh, heterogeneous effects regarding the, kind of the type of conflict, right? Or, or the effect yeah, the of the the underlying potential for conflict in a sense, yeah. Right, so um, I suppose getting at that would be splitting uh, splitting the uh, conflicts, uh, the type of conflicts uh, in the data in some way, I suppose. And also there, I, uh, sample size is, a, is an issue. Um, so also that adding to one of those lists uh, <laughs> of uh, what one can try to dig deeper into um but thanks for the comment i'll 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 have to think more of it uh, i don't have a great answer uh how to address it thanks um i feel like i'm abusing my powers as chair asking all the questions but it doesn't feel like i'm crowding out anyone so i'm going to keep going uh my christelle i i really so I, I really like what you're doing and i really love the the graph where you show that like before the, like in the early 20s and 30s there was no difference between the british and the french and there's a big difference and the kind of the difference goes back so i think that's like a it's pretty cool graph and i was kind of wondering whether there's anything one thing that would be useful is to compare those effects to like the effects of kind of more recent attempts at uh, having family planning policies like where are the, the results kind of overall in the same ballpark or where some, there was something very specific about those, those colonial policies on one front. But also, do you see that the effect of, uh, I'm sure there's some estimates around of like the effect of those fertility policies. And do you find different effects uh, for like former French and former British colonies? Maybe kind of to see of like kind of persistence effect of how some of those things occur. And I don't, I'm just trying to 
to kind of maybe provide a richer description of what of the kind of the long run effect of the of some of those policies in a sense. So you 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 are talking about this uh, uh, event study analysis or the uh, descriptive graph about that shows the trend, uh, the fertility trend. So I was I was commenting on the the event studies. Okay. That's I I said that I, that graph is great, but I'm thinking in terms of like as further an analysis that you might be able to do is look at one is uh, just kind of comparing the the effect that you find to like more recent attempts at reducing fertility but also mm -hmm. on that line like do you see different effect of those fertility policies in form of french and former british colonies mm -hmm. okay. kind of, it could also because that could be like a double whammy right it's like you have these bad policies in the past and then mm -hmm. it becomes even harder to reduce them in the in the present time yeah which yeah. might also explain what it goes down slowly mm -hmm. that's interesting uh I don't know to what extent we, uh, um, I, I can, I'm thinking about the data uh, because yeah, uh, yeah that's, uh, that, that will probably be uh, the uh, limitation, uh, especially if we want to uh, look at cohorts that are very um, contemporary, contemporaneous mm -hmm. cohorts, we might have some limitation <coughs> at, that, uh, at that point. Uh, but yeah, definitely I will try to see whether this is uh, something that can be done eventually also thinking about some kind of uh, uh, using data from other RCTs that implemented, yeah. you know, family planning programs and see whether we have this kind of um, difference. Yeah. But thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, um, uh, Jacob. Yeah, I have a question for uh, Felix. Very interesting talk and, uh, and paper. I would be interested in hearing you elaborate a little bit more on what you think um, politicians actually do to achieve this and what you can test in that, uh, in that kind of realm. I'm thinking of you know, uh, tax policy, uh, uh, trade policy, tariffs, uh, regulations, et cetera. Uh, thanks. Um, I I think there's a lot of heterogeneity going on. Um, I actually have another project where I use the same data to explore uh, what happened after the gas was discovered. So like in 2009, you have this really massive inflow of, of money. Um, long story short, I think the main issue, if, you, if you're honest, then the private sector, I think in Mozambique is just a big system that keeps a small elite in power and it's basically just not really i think it's even fair to say i don't know if it's really i mean it's hard to compare but i think it's actually not one particular thing that's the issue that people exploit i think it's actually that it's just the the private sector is by design to make sure that a certain group stays in power and and the thing is they they started off a socialist country then they had to privatize a lot of uh with the with the, when the World Bank and when they became part of the, the IMF. And um, through these privatizations, it's just there were like so many policy problems that I think a lot of donors just simply accepted that a certain group will be in power. Now that's my personal take on that. So it might be a bit sinistic, but I think it's not one particular issue. And it's it's also just about like who wants to invest in it. If you, if you look, when foreign companies uh, come in, I think they strategically choose to work with politicians because it's just a good saving for your investment, right? Because they know the country, right? And you can be certain that they will make sure that your policies go through. That's that's my kind of cynical answer. Um, but Jakob, I also had a question. Um, sorry if I missed that point, but um, can you elaborate a bit regarding the quality and quantity of blue helmets because i imagine that uh, blue helmet troops from sweden are different than blue helmet troops from bangladesh or something like that very true so that's uh, another um, uh, source of heterogeneous effects so the identifying variation uh, that uh, you know pops out in my data comes from uh, mostly uh, oecd countries 
but that's not actually, and I didn't have time to kind of go into this, that's not the majority of where troops come from uh, in the post-Cold War era. That's Central Asian uh, countries like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, for example, are huge contributors. And the bulk of the troops in these missions actually come uh, from these countries. Um, there is a bit of it, perhaps controversial to talk about true quality and how to measure it. That's, that's tricky, but I, I suppose it's uh, fair to say that the quality of the troops from the US, for example, is generally higher than uh, many of the other uh, troops from, coming from developing countries. And in terms of my, so, so it's a valid point. It's, it's a bit of a, uh, to, to me, a black box. It's been attempted in the, in the literature on peacekeeping to try to get a proxy at that uh, using uh, military spending, uh, et cetera. But it's a, a very crude measure of you because we don't know how much was spent on those troops uh, sent to that exact mission. There's no uh, data on that uh, that I'm aware of uh, that can measure uh, quality in that sense. So that's just um, something that's probably hidden uh, you know, uh, in my analysis, a, a heter heterogeneous so, uh, effect. So it's also one of the reasons uh, why uh, an IV attempt, for example, is, is out of the question because uh, I, I'm not sure whether or not, you know, I think this is indirect uh, suggestive evidence that peacekeepers are effective, but I can't really, you know, uh, instrument the number of troops because the quality of troops is likely to be affected as well, as well as these alternative potential channels like trade, informal political talks, sanctions, etc that might be a play at the same time. So it's really uh, uh, something I'm, I'm, I'm leaning on in the conclusions that you know, I've established this reduced form relationship between electoral cycles uh, in troops and in countries, in, in OECD countries primarily, uh, and how that seems to affect uh, conflict outcomes. So that's, yeah, a um, bit of uh, <laughs> elaboration on, on that topic. Great. Um... Okay, we have a few more minutes if there's any kind of uh, final burning questions. All right, looks like there is no burning question left over. So um, I will let all of us go.